O Lord, who has taught us that all of our doings without charity are nothing, pour into our hearts bounding love, kindness, and charity by, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're on page 10803 of volume two of John Fox's Acts and Monuments, and we're, we've got Dr. John Wycliffe now appearing in St. Paul's in London, cited by the bishop, and we're following some of the chaos that ensued. So we'll pick up here. This is 1377. And as there were many other things which required their vigilant care and dil diligence, so one thing there was, which he could in no wise but admonish them of, which was this, necessary to be considered of them all, how the Lord Marshal Henry Percy in his place within himself had in one ward in custody, whether with the knowledge or without the knowledge of them, he could not tell. This he could tell that the said Lord Marshal was not allowed any such ward or prison in his house within the liberties of the city which thing, <clears throat> if it not be seen in time, the example thereof being suffered, whatever that's all about. The words of the Lord Fitzwalter were no sooner spoken, but they were as, as soon taken by the rash citizens, who in all hasty fury, running to their armor and weapons, went immediately to the house of Lord Percy, were breaking up the gates by violence. They took out the prisoner and burned the stocks wherein he sat in the midst of London. Then the Lord Percy sought for, whom, saith the story, they would doubtless have slain if they had might have found him with their bills and javelins. All corners and privy chambers were searched and in beds and hangings torn asunder. But the Lord Percy, as God would, was then with the Duke, who won John Ipper the same day with great instance, had desired to, dis to dinner. The Londoners, not finding him at home, supposing that he was with the Duke at the Savoy, and all hasty heat turned their power thither, running as fast as they could to the Duke's house, where also in like manner they were disappointed of their cruel purpose in the meanwhile, as this was doing, cometh one of the Duke's men, running post haste to the Duke and to the Lord Percy, declaring what was done. The Duke, being then at his oysters, without any further tarrying, and also breaking both his shins at the form for haste, took boat with the Lord Percy, and by water went to Kingston, where the then princess with Richard, the young prince, did lie. And there declared unto the princess all the whole matter concerning the outrage of the Londoners, as it was, to whom she promised again that such an order should be taken in the matter as should be to his satisfaction. At the time, the commons of London thus, as it is said, were about the Duke's house of Savoy, there meeteth with them a certain priest, who, marveling at the sudden rage and concourse, asked what they sought, to whom answer was given again by some, that they sought for the Duke and Lord Marshal, to have of them the Lord Peter de la Mar, whom they wrongfully detained in prison. To this the priest answered again more boldly than opportunely, that Peter said he is a false traitor to the king, and worthy long since to be hanged. The hearing of these words, the fur furious people with a terrible shout cried upon him that he was a traitor and one that took the Duke's part. And so falling him upon him with their weapons, strove who might first strike him. And after they had wounded him very sore, they had him so wounded to prison, where within a few days for the soreness of his wounds, he died. Neither would the rage of the people thus have ceased had not the Bishop of London, leaving his dinner, 
come to them at Savoy and putting them in remembrance of the blessed time, as they term it, of Lent, that persuaded them to cease and be quiet. The Londoners, seeing that they could get no advantage against the Duke, who was without their reach, to wreak their anger, took his arms, which in the most despiteful ways, they hanged up in the open places of the city in sign of reproach as for a traitor. Insomuch that when one of his gentlemen came through the city with a plate containing the Duke's arms, hanging by a lace about his neck, the citizens, not abiding the sight thereof, cast him from his horse and plucked his escutcheon from him and were about to work the extremity against him had not the mayor rescued him out of their hands and sent him home safe unto Duke, his master. And such hatred then was the Duke among the vulgar people of London after this, the princes, understanding the hearts and broil of the Londoners set against the aforesaid duke, sent to London three knights, Sir Albred Lure, Sir Simon Burley, and Sir Lewis Clifford, to entreat the citizens to be reconciled with the duke. The Londoners answered that they, for the honor of the princess, would obey and do all reverence what she would require. But this they required and joined the messengers to say to the Duke by word of mouth that he should suffer the Bishop of Winchester before mentioned and also the Lord Peter de la Mar to come to their answer and to be judged by their peers whether they might either be quit if they were guiltless or otherwise if they be found culpable they might receive according to their deserts after the laws of the realm. What grief and displeasure this duke conceived and retained in his mind thereof. Again, what means and suit the Londoners on their part made to the old king for their liberties. What rhymes and songs in London were made against the duke. How the bishop, bishops at the duke's request were moved to excommunicate those malicious slanderers and moreover how the duke at last was revenged of those contumelies and injuries, how he had caused them to be brought before the king, how sharply they were rebuked for their misdemeanor by the worthy oration of the Lord Chamberlain Robert Aston, in the presence of the king, archbishops, bishops, and divers other states, the king's children and other nobilities of the realm, in conclusion, how the Londoners were compelled to this at length by the common assent in public charges of the city to make a great taper of wax, which, with the Duke's arms set upon it, should be brought with solemn procession to the Church of St. Paul, there to, boot, continue, to burn continually before the image of Our Lady. And at last, how that before the said Duke and the Londoners were reconciled together in the beginning of the reign of the new king with a kiss of peace, and how the same reconcilement was publicly announced in the Church of Westminster, and what joy was in the whole city thereof. These, because they are impertinent and make too long a digression from the matter of Wycliffe, I cut off with brevity referring the reader to other histories, such as that is of St. Albans, where they're there to be found at large. As these aforesaid things, for brevity's sake, I pass over, so I cannot omit, though I will not be long, that which happened the same time and year, 1377, to the Bishop of Norwich, to the intent that his posterity now may see to what pride the clergy of the Pope's church had then grown. <clears throat> At the same time that this broil was in London, the Bishop of Norwich, a little after Easter, coming to the town of Len Lenham, belonging to his lordship, being not contented with the old accustomed honor due unto him and used of his predecessors before in the same town, 
required, moreover, with the new and unused kind of magnificence to be exalted, insomuch that when he saw the chief magistrate or mayor of that town to go in the streets with his officer going before him, holding a certain wand in his hand, tipped at both ends with black horn, as the manner was, he, reputing himself to be lord of that town as he was, and thinking to be higher than the highest, commanded the honor of that stage due to the mayor to be yielded and borne before his lordly personage. The mayor or bailiff with the other towns then courteously answered him that they were right willing and contented with all their hearts to exhibit and reverence him and would so do if he first of the king and council could obtain that custom and if the same might be induced after any peaceable way with good wills of commons in the body of the town. Otherwise, said they, as the matter was dangerous, so they durst not take in hand any new alteration of ancient customs and liberties, lest the people were always inclinable and prone to evil, and fall upon them with stones and drive them out of the town. Wherefore, kneeling on their knee knees before him, they humbly besought him that he would require no such thing of them, that he would save his own honor and their lives, who otherwise, if he intended that way, were in great danger. But the bishop, youthful and haughty, taking occasion by their humbleness, to swell the more in himself answered that he would not be taught by their counsel, but that he would have it done, though all the commons whom he named ribalds say nay. And he rebuked the mayor and his brethren for meacocks and dastards for so fearing the vulgar sort of people. The citizens, perceiving the willful stoutness of the bishop, meekly answering again, said they minded not to resist him, but to let him do therein what he thought good. Only they desired him that he would license them to depart and hold them excused for not waiting upon him and conducting him out of the town with that reverence which he required. For if they should be seen in his company, all the suspicion thereof would be upon them so that they all should be in danger. The bishop, not regarding the, their advice and counsel, commanded one of his men to take the rod borne before the mayor and to carry the same before him, which being done and perceived to the commons, the bishop after that man manner went not far, but the rude people running to shut the gates came out with their bows, some with clubs and staves, some with other instruments, some with stones and let drive at the bishop and his men as fast as they might in such sort that both the bishop and his horse under him, with most part of his men, were hurt and wounded. And thus the glorious pride of the jolly prelate, ruffling in his new scepter, was received and welcomed there. That is, he was so pelted with bats and stones, so wounded with arrows and other instruments fit for such a skirmish, that the most part of his men with with his mace bearer, while running away from him, the poor wounded bishop was left there alone, not able to keep his old power, who went about to usurp a new power more than to him belonged. Thus, as is commonly true in all, so it is well exemplified here, that which is commonly said, and as it is commonly seen, that pride will have a fall and power usurped will never stand. In like manner, if the citizens of Rome, following the example of these Lenin men, as they have like cause and greater to do by the usurped power of their bush at wood after the same sauce, handle the pulp and unsceptre him of his mace and regality, which nothing pertained to him, they in so doing should recover their own liberties with more honor at home and more commendation abroad. 
this tragedy with all the parts thereof being thus ended at Lenham, a little after Easter, as it is said, about the month of April 1377, the same year, on the 12th day of June, died the worthy and victorious Prince King Edward III, after he had reigned 51 years, a prince not more aged in years than renowned for many singular and heroic virtues, but principally noted and lauded for his singular meekness and clemency toward his subjects and inferiors, ruling them by gentleness and mercy without all rigor and austere severity. Among other noble and royal ornaments of his nature, worthily and copiously set forth of many. Thus he is described by some, which may briefly su suffice for the comprehension of all the rest. To the orphans he was a father, compassionate to the afflicted, mourning with the miserable, relieving the oppressed, and to all them that wanted, and helper in time of need. But chiefly above all other things in this prince, in my mind, to be commemorated is this, that he, above all other kings of this realm, unto the time of King Henry VIII, was the great, greatest bridler of the Pope's usurped power and outrageous oppression. During all the time of which, as king, not only the Pope could not greatly prevail in this realm, but also John Wycliffe was maintained with favor and aid sufficient. <clears throat> but before we close up the story of this king, there cometh to hand that which I thought good not to omit, the noble purpose of the king in requiring a view to be taken in all his dominions of benefices and dignities, ecclesiastical remaining in the hands of the Italians and aliens, with the true valuation of the same directed down by commission whereof the like is to be found in the time of Richard II, the tenor of which commission of King Edward III, I thought here to set down for worthy memory. The king directed writs and all the bishops of England in this form, Edward, by the grace of God, King, to the Reverend Father in Christ, and then it's got N, by the same grace, Lord Bishop of L, reading, being willing upon certain causes to be certified what and how many benefices as well as archdeaconries and other dignities as vicarages, personages, prebends and chapels within your device, diocese, be it this present in the hands of the Italians and other strangers, what they may be of what value and how every of the said benefices be called by name and how much of every of the same is worth by the year, uh, as by the way of tax or extent, but according to the true value of the same. Likewise of the names of all and singular, such strangers being now incumbents or occupying the same in every of them, moreover the names of all of them, whether Englishmen or strangers, of what state or condition soever they be, have the occupation or disposition of such benefices with the fruits and profits of the same in the behalf or by the authority of the aforesaid strangers by way of farm or title or procuration or by any other means whatsoever and how long they have been occupied or disposed the same. We command you as we heretofore commanded you that you send us a true certificate of all the singular premises into our high court of chancery under your seal distinctly and openly on the said feast of the ascension of our Lord next coming without further delay or turning unto us this writ with all witness ourself at Westminster the 16th day of April in the 48th year of our reign of England over France, the 35th year, 1375. It looks like it's the end of it, I think. By virtue hereof, certificate was sent up to the king into his chancery out of every diocese of England, a 
of all such spiritual livings as were then in the occupation either of priors, aliens, or other strangers, whereof the number was so great as being all set down, it would fill almost half a choir of paper, whereby may appear that it was high time for the king to seek remedy herein, either by treat treaty with the Pope or otherwise, considering so great a portion of the revenues of his realm was by this means conveyed away and employed either for the relief of his enemies or the maintenance of the foreigners, amongst which the number of cardinals of the court of Rome lack not their share, as may appear by this which follows. View of ecclesiastical benefices. This is Coventry and Litchfield. The Lord Francis of the title of St. Sabian, priest and cardinal of the Holy Church of Rome, doth hold and enjoy the deanery of the Cathedral Church of Litchfield, the jurisdiction of Litchfield, which is worth 500 marks by the year, and the prebend of Brewood, and the personage of Adbast, and to the same deanery annexed, which prebend is worth by the year four score marks, and the parsonage twenty pounds, which deanery with the prebends and parsonage aforesaid he hath holden and occupied for the space of three years. And one master de Ingrisia, a stranger, as proctor to the said cardinal, doth hold and occupy the same deanery with the other premises, with the appurtenances by the name of proctor during the years aforesaid and hath taken up the fruits and profits for the said cardinal, dwelling not in the realm, Norwich. Lord William, Cardinal of St. Angelo, a stranger, doth hold the archdeaconry of Suffolk, by virtue of provision apostolical from the feast of St. Nicholas last past. He is not resident upon his said archdeaconry, and the said archdeaconry, together with the procurations, do by reason of the visitation is worth 66 pounds, 13 shillings, and 4 pence. And Master John of Hellington doth occupy the seal of the official of the said archdeaconry. Lord Reginald of St. Adrian, Deacon Cardinal, hath in the said county the personage of Godal Godalming worth forty pounds, and one Edward Tuis doth farm the said parsonage for nine years past. The Lord Anglicus of the Holy Church of Rome, priest and cardinal, a stranger, was incumbent and did hold in possession the deanery of the Cathedral Church of York from the eleventh day of November 1366, and it is yearly worth according to true, true value of 400 pounds. Master John Stoke, canon of the said church, doth occupy the said deanery and the prophets of the same in the name of the authority of the Lord Dean. But the said dean was never resident upon the said deanery since he was admitted thereto. <sighs> Item, Lord Simon of the title of St. Sixth, priest and cardinal, doth possess the prebend of Wistow in the said church of York, worth by year 100 pounds. The aforesaid Master John of Stoke doth occupy the aforesaid prebend and the profits thereof, but the said Lord Simon is not resident upon the prebend. Item, Lord Francis, of the title of St. Sabine, pre and cardinal, stranger, doth possess the prebend of Strancel in the said church of York, worth by year 100 marks. And Master William of Murfield doth occupy the said prebend, but the said Lord Francis is not resident upon the said prebend. The deanery of the Church of Salisbury, with churches and chapels underwritten to the same deanery annexed, doth remain in the hands of Lord Reginald of the title of St. Adrian, deacon and cardinal, 
so hath remained these 26 years, who's never resident. His proctor is one Loris de Ingres, a stranger, and it is worth by year 254 pounds, 12 shillings and 4 pence. Richard, Richard Bishop doth hold the vicarage of Mere to the deanery annexed, and hath holden it for 19 years. Robert Codford, the farmer of the church of Height, buried to the same annexed worth 50 years. The church of Stoning and the chapel of Rescobs to the same deanery annexed worth by a year 70 marks. And it just goes down through this long list here. The treasury of the church of Sarum, church and chapels in the hands of Lord John of the title St. Mark, priest and cardinal, 12 years, never resident, worth 136 pounds. Church of Fielding, Aldward Berry, Calv, Archdeaconry of Berks, and the Cathedral Church of Salisbury, in the hands of a William of St. Stephen, never resident, worth by year eight score marks. Archdeaconry of Dorset, Prebend of Woodford and Wilford in Salisbury, Prebend Gillingham, more, more on the Lord Cardinal of Canterbury, his Archdeacon of Wells, and hath annexed to his Archdeaconry the churches of Hewish, Burrs, South Brent, 160 pounds, and then the Church of Wells. On and on it goes, prebendary this, prebendary that. Unbelievable. All these guys are foreigners, Italians. Oh boy, oh boy, on it goes down to about page 810, and we'll call that here. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Godspeed.